The following Truth Barista podcast is a High Beam Ministry production. There's a picture that I stumbled across, and it's one of Time's 100 most influential images of all time. And it's the picture of this young girl. She's on her way from her village to a feeding center not far away. And she's so malnourished, and she's moving so slow that this vulture is waiting to attack. So the young man that took this picture, I think there was probably something in his heart that he, he wanted to do good, he just, he wasn't sure, so, so he, he captured this picture and he just waited and, and then the vulture got closer, so he kind of shooed the vulture off and then he walked away and the vulture would come right back. And he was told, because of some of the sicknesses in the areas, don't touch anybody, don't do anything, and so he didn't, he didn't. He did nothing, because apparently the cost was too much. So he left. He went back. The New York Times published this photo in 1993. In 94, he won the Pulitzer Prize for this photo. Four months after this, he chose to end his life. You see, every single one of us, we have a chance to be successful in life. And you know what? I hope you are. I really do. I I hope you're successful. There's nothing wrong with being successful. But success is just about you. But significance is about other people. You see, that man that took that picture, he had success. That's one of the greatest honors a photographer could ever have. But obviously it wasn't enough. It wasn't enough. So what's going to be enough for you? You see, success is great. You can do a lot of things with it, but it's not going to be fulfilling. It wasn't worth it to go pick her up. It wasn't worth it to give her a hug. It wasn't worth it to tell her about the gospel. Yeah, I won a Pulitzer Prize, but what does it matter? What does it matter? It doesn't. And I think the greatest tragedy in life is we're going to look back one day and say, I was successful in things that don't matter. I want you to be successful. But more than anything, I want you to be significant. And when you live for Jesus and you love people, I believe you're going to have a life of significance. We are presenting God's truth for our day. You're listening to The Truth Barista, a production of HighBeamMinistry.com. Welcome to the Airzats Coffee Shop. This is Jay, your Truth Barista, and I'm serving up a steamy cup of God's truth for the average Joe. You can catch me and this podcast on my websites, truthbarista.com, all one word, truthbarista.com, and highbeamministry.com. That's H-I-G-H-B-E-A-M, ministry.com, as in car high beam. We're shining the light of God's truth on the road ahead. Truth Barista, Truth Barista, Truth Barista. What are you so excited about, Mr. Larry? It's our Bible study day, and and we're going to be in that anointed booth again. And I just can't wait because you have so much insight to the Bible and what God is telling us today. And I know you've got a theme today that's going to be a barn burner. Oh, it is. You know, I've loved our discussion over the last couple weeks on these deceptive beliefs that people have, and and really it's. It's funny how some people believe they're actually biblical, you know, like God helps those who help themselves. And I believe that comes from the book of uh, First Imaginations, <laughs> chapter 4, verse 2. But it is really funny because as we're going through these, I know there are people in the booths here that are having coffee who are listening to us who are going, yeah, I've heard that too, but I don't know how to answer that according to the Bible. And so what I've decided to do, if you look in your hands right there, that piece of paper I just handed you, yeah. okay, you see it? Yeah, I got it. All of these things we were talking about. Absolutely, and you emboldened them as well. I mean... I did. You're too narrow-minded, Truth Barista, people will say. (laughs) Or, Truth Barista, there's no hell. Or, Truth Barista, no one can know if there's a God. Those kinds of things. Yeah, the same stuff we've been talking about the last couple weeks. Well, I have two that I want to talk about today Hmm. that I'm not even going to show you some of my notes. I'm going to play them very close to my chest because I I want to get your reaction first, and then we'll dive into them. Are well, you ready? Yeah, I am, but there's not going to be a test, is there? No, there's just going to be high test, high test caffeine. Oh. And I want you to keep an eye on the clock on the wall there, because 
I'm almost out of coffee here. Okay, you ready? Oh, I'm ready. Here we go. Sending people to hell is unjust. Now, what do you think of that? Well, you know, to be honest with you, if you don't know what the Bible is about, I think that's a logical, reasonable conclusion. Okay, why? Well, because in my pre-Christ life, I would say, well, no, God is unjust because he makes us. We didn't have a choice in the matter. We didn't go to God in the beginning and say, God, I want to be born. I want to have a life. I want to be a human. So he comes up with the idea. He makes us human and then kind of lets us go and we screw up. And then at the end of our lives of screwing things up, he says, you're going to hell. I just thought that's a little bit bit unfair. Okay. Yes, I can definitely see where the world would go with that. Here's another one. God has the ability to save everyone through Jesus' work. Okay. So if he doesn't, and he has the ability and sends people to hell, then he is unjust. Do you catch that? Oh, I did. Yeah, that's kind of a mind teaser, but yeah, that's right, because it's Bible. But if you didn't have the Bible to really give that instruction, I think most people go with my scenario. Restate your scenario again, and we'll talk about that one. Well, I just think going to hell is unjust because he created us in the first place. We didn't ask for it, so we're created, and we make mistakes, and those mistakes are made, and then we get punished for them. Okay. That seems to be unfair. The fallacy in all of that is God did create us perfectly, but he did it in Adam and Eve at the beginning of humanity. And at the fall, Adam and Eve, as the federal head, and I'll explain why that's important, when they disobeyed, they made the choice to break God's law. And that's what brought the sin judgment upon us. God said, in the day that you do this, you will die. He didn't say it after they sinned. He said it before they sinned. They were warned, okay? In the day that you do this, you will suffer a penalty of dying. And the penalty of dying is when your body gives out and surrenders your spirit because of that sin stain, that rebellion stain, that violation of God's law. You can't go to live with God. You have to go someplace else. And so they called that Sheol. They looked at it as kind of like the holding tank of the dead in the earth. Okay, so if you can't be with God because you violated his law, you have to go to jail. And so you go to jail, it's called Sheol. Got it? Yeah, well, that's what we a lot of people call hell, right? Exactly. Yeah. That's we, the Greek we, version of that is hell. is hell. Okay, so here's the thing. God created us perfect. It was us who chose to do things against God's law. Now... Sending people to hell by violating God's law is no more unjust than us sending a person to prison for violating society's laws. What's the difference? What makes us able to do this and not be called unjust, and yet God does the exact same thing, who has a bigger right to do it, and we call him unjust? I mean, we create laws, but God is the basis of law. What is right? What is wrong? And so we arbitrarily say, you know, eating a Tootsie Pop on Thursdays will get you, you know, a six-month stint in jail. Okay, that's just out of thin air kind of a thing. But God says, no, killing a human being is against the law because you have no authority to take a life unjustly or without just cause. And so somebody who eats a Tootsie Pop on Thursday, we have no problem sending them to jail because that's what the law says, right? right? But God will allow somebody to kill somebody in an abortion or will do it in murder and will say, oh, well, you got to go to jail. So God is unjust, but we're not. I mean, really. I mean, does God really, I mean, really send anyone to hell? I mean, he does set the standard. He does set the rule, correct? But it's our right. behavior. It's our sinful behavior that sends us there. We're sort of our own judges. Because if we continue right. in our sin, and we continue to rebel and continue to live unholy, undisciplined lives that is just, you know, like a tumbleweed of evil, well, that's our own judgment on ourselves. And God says, hey, you did it to yourself. You're going to hell. Yeah, you bring the judgment on yourself. And I like this because God is very clear about it. He says, if you live life according to my moral standard perfectly, you will not go to hell. Okay, part two. 
we realize that our nature is such that we like to do things our way, and oftentimes that's rebelling against God and breaking his law, so we bring the hell judgment upon ourselves. Thirdly, God says, you know, I'm not content with that because I don't want my kids to die. He doesn't want anybody to go to hell, whether he quote-unquote sends them or they choose to do so. So he says, here, I've come up with a plan. I'll let Jesus take your judgment for you, and now you can stay with me and not go to hell. So now humanity is really at the point that God has done everything in his love and power to keep you out of hell. Therefore, everybody who is going to hell or winds up in hell has actually chosen to do so by rejecting the plan. And, and so if you want to talk about God being unjust, it's not God who's unjust. He punished the sin. It's either Jesus or you that take it, period. But if you choose to do things your way and demanding God do it your way, then you are being unjust and you're judging the judge. Not a good plan to judge the judge. So right. Jesus, I have heard, did talk about hell even more than he did heaven. Is that true? And why would it be true if it is? I've heard the same thing. I can't tell you for sure. I haven't done a study on the number of times he's talked about hell, but hell is a major topic. And I think as I just kind of run through the scriptures in my head, that Jesus is warning people. You see, if you are an unjust judge, you don't tell people about the law. And if they know about the law, you don't warn them if their actions get close to violating the law. And if you're an unjust judge, and you don't tell them if they violated the law, you just drop the hammer. Okay, but God has done all three of those things for us. He's given us and shown us the boundary. He warns us that there's a boundary, and he warns us when we cross the boundary. And let's add, again, that fourth thing. He has dealt with this aspect of what happens when you cross the boundary. You know, it's very interesting to me. If you buy a Tesla, you run that Tesla according to the design of the Tesla designer. So you don't try to put gas in a all-electric car because it's going to ruin it. Plus, you wouldn't have a tank to put it in, but you know what I mean just misusing it. So God is the inventor, if we want to use that metaphor. He's the inventor. He created us for a reason and a purpose, and he did so in a way that we need to be managed by his laws, or we would be like putting gasoline into a Tesla. It just doesn't work. Life is disastrous. Right. Let me uh, refine your example a little bit, because okay. I used to be a school bus driver for a number of years. Okay. And of course, they run on diesel. Well, you don't put gas in a diesel car. You don't put diesel in a gas car. Why? Because you will destroy the vehicle. Same thing. God designed us as human beings, body, soul, and spirit, to work according to his owner's manual. Whether you like it or not, according to his laws, according to his commands. If you violate the commands, your vehicle, your body, and your soul, and everything else will be destroyed. It's the same thing as you may not like the law of gravity, but you can violate it if you want. You can step off a cliff if you want. That's your choice. But what happens to you at the end, inevitably, that's part of your choice. And again, I keep coming back to that thing. God has done everything to warn us ahead of time, to warn us when we're getting close, to warn us after we've stepped over the line, and then to tell us how to deal with that so we don't go splat at the end of our lives into hell. You step off God's moral gravity, you're going to fall into the pit, plain and simple. Ouch. Oh, my. Oh, that hurts. We came up with that idea of splat theology exactly. uh, a few weeks ago, and it, uh, it stuck. It really is good. But, you know, we need to have another kind of theology, and that is called caffeine theology or coffee theology, because I can see that your cup is almost empty, Truth Barista. Well, that is true. Um, Paul did talk about us being continually filled with the Spirit. I think in the uh, book of 1 J, chapter 5, it says be continually filled with coffee so if you would be so kind sir I will Truth Barista you know this particular podcast has so much good value to it in fact I was talking to somebody the other day and they said this you deal with topics I don't hear in church what do you think of that I think that's great and that's exactly what we do why well you know in some churches pastors have a lot of responsibility a lot of people to answer to they've got a lot of things to do and there are some biblical truths that go unaddressed for various reasons and what we like to do is 
is we like to fill in the gap. We're here to add value to the come alongside pastors and address maybe some hot topics that they can't or won't address. We want to hit those hot topics head on because the body needs to hear the whole truth and nothing but the truth. And that's what they will hear when they tune in because after all, you are the truth barista. You come up with the best topics and the best solutions to the things that people are really struggling with in society, in their minds, or in their practice. We don't proclaim to know the whole truth here, but we do know the truth, and we just discuss, and we ruminate, and we mull over all these topics to give people something to think about, but we always try to keep it thoroughly grounded on God's truth. So if you're listening to the Truth Barista podcast, this can be great for just you or small groups, home groups when you're out on a walk or when you're biking could even be used as a pulpit fuller who knows but we're here to teach on various topics and we don't shy away from any of them so you can take the truth barista podcast and you can share it with your friends and the whole podcast really is designed and produced by high beam ministry and what is high beam ministry well high beam ministry is about shining the light of god's truth on the road ahead we need god's truth to guide us through life and through a variety of media the truth barista podcast the frothy thoughts blog video classes online teachings we bring it all and the web address is highbeamministry.com high beam ministry Ministry.com. Okay, so we're talking about hell. You know, it, it's quite a hell of a story. Yep. <laughs> well, I see what you did there. That is really clever. Okay, well, let's talk about something that, you know, I did briefly mention it just a few minutes ago, and it's a very sensitive topic. I don't want to deal with the whole judgment aspect of this topic. I just want to talk about one deceptive idea that's out there, and it's this. And, of course, being in the Erzatz Coffee Shop near Big Brain University, we have a lot of liberally minded minded and progressive minded or regressive minded, however you want to put it, students coming in here and we get into the hot topics. We get into abortion. We get into sexual topics and gender topics and other things on uh, societal issues. Well, I hear this one a lot. Abortion is not about a child. It's just tissue. So how would you respond? And I'll give you something from from the word. Well, this is one that's always been a, a hard one for me because I think when life is conceived, that's when life starts. And so that child is a child at that point. I don't care how you twist the definitions or whatever, that conception is going to end up as a child. So you're actually murdering a child, even if it's not fully gestated and coming out as a baby. It's still a baby at the time it was conceived. So I think you're right. I think people who believe in abortion and think abortion is fine, they're just mistaken, very deceived. Right. And if they justify abortion because it's just this inanimate bit of tissue, like some sort of a word on your finger or, you know, a sty in your eye, something like that, well, they're greatly misled. And God's truth is very clear. Well, I think the abortion issue, Truth Barista, started back, of course, you know, a long time ago, but it, it became legislatively a part of our society back in the 60s. But I believe at that point we started to devalue life. And now we see it in our streets, in our, in our cities, where people are just shooting each other with no no reason whatsoever. In our city here in Minneapolis, we had three children shot with no ramifications. Nobody's been tried or nobody's been caught. I mean, it's just a devaluation of what the human being is. It started, I think, with the abortion issue. Well, and that's true. The abortion issue, when you devalue a person into just a blob of tissue before birth, then that's your justification for doing what you're doing. So therefore, it's logical. It would carry over after birth and you can devalue people and dehumanize people as a justification to kill them. That's one reason why Hitler himself devalued and dehumanized the Jewish people and others, I might add, okay, as unwantables and undesirables and then, well, it's, I'm not killing a human being, I'm just killing a walking piece of tissue, you know, or a person who is subhuman, okay? I was appalled when Governor Mayor Cuomo in New York signed the bill, said, you can kill a child even after it's been born by not giving it sustenance. And this whole idea, I mean, that has crossed the line. And if, if anybody needs to repent, he and that entire gang over in New York and other realms that did that need to repent big time. But here's the scripture that comes to mind, uh, John 16, 21. But as soon as she delivers the child, 
She no longer remembers the anguish for joy that a child is born into the world. Now, Jesus here is talking about coming through difficulties and equating labor and delivery with the difficulties in life. But it's fascinating. He chose the illustration of a pre-born child. Now, if you go to the Psalms, the Psalms David wrote, I am fearfully and wonderfully made. If you go throughout the Bible, the Bible affirms the fact that once a person is pregnant, that is a human being in there. It is not a potential human being. It is not a blob of tissue. It is a human being. And if you leave it alone and nurture it, it will emerge as a human being. So, I mean, even the ancients knew that this is a baby. However... Science has been used to create justifications to fulfill our desires. So hence they're going, well, it's not breathing on its own, it's connected to the mother, so therefore it's just an, a tissue extension of the mother. Well, at what point can you separate that child from the mother and it stays alive? I have held a baby in my hand. Normal gestation is what, 40, 42 weeks? Something like that, yeah. I held a baby in my hand that was no bigger than my hand. Her name was Victoria. Mm. And she was born, I think it was two months early. It was amazing. And she survived into her 20s. Yes, she had physical problems because of her birth. But here I'm holding this tiny little being and I'm going, nobody can abort something like this and say that it's just tissue. This was a person. Okay, so now you have to say how far back... Do you have to go before a person who says it's tissue says it becomes a human being? Do you go to the three-month mark? Do you go to the two-month mark? Do you go to the one-month mark? I mean, when you're talking about humanity and life, people say, well, brain waves and a heartbeat denote life of a human being. Well, there's a heartbeat at 18 days mm -hmm. from conception. Right. Okay, you can't then perform an abortion under biblical guidelines past 18 days. You don't even know you're pregnant right. until after 18 days. So at that point, I think to be on the biblical safe side, you just say, hey, from the moment of conception. And then I go back and I say, hey, if you don't want that tissue, then carry it through to birth. Yeah. Marshal the church and its resources to say, we'll help you birth the baby, and then we'll adopt the baby. Why kill it? Why kill it? That's a great question. You know, when you stop and think about all of these things, it kind of comes to a head when you think about your view on life. And if your view on life doesn't have a God component in it, anything goes. Anything goes. And that's right. why we do have abortion. And science will support abortion and so forth. What I don't understand are people in the church, people who call themselves Christians, supporting abortion. I just can't quite understand that. And it says to me, Truth Barista, that people do not fear the Lord because if life comes from the Lord and they disvalue life, well, then they're ultimately disvaluing him. I mean, there's no fear of God. So we'll do what right. we want to do. And abortion is mm -hmm. an example. Yeah. Well, here's another a very ironic argument that I've I actually heard of this or thought about this very much in my early days. And it's actually, I was kind of pro-choice in my college years until I actually grew a brain. No, I'm just kidding. But not until I actually learned the Lord's word and got his perspective on this, but here's something from a human standpoint, too. Back, Remember back in the 70s, they were worried about the California condors becoming extinct? Right. And they actually have laws, right? Do you remember that? Yeah, I sure do. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay, they actually have laws on endangered creatures like the California condor. If you take a condor egg and you break it and destroy that growing embryo in the egg, you're going to prison. You're going to prison. But then I can use the same argument that everybody else, well, it's just a bunch of tissue. It's just an egg. I mean, it's not really a condor until it's born. And people who then use this argument look at me blankly and they go, well, it's different. And you go, how is it different? Are you telling me that a bird is of greater value than a human being? Are you saying that different forms of life, as far as animal life and bird life, have greater value than a human being? You want to talk about devaluing human beings. This is where people will throw themselves and chain themselves to a tree lest you cut it down and kill it, but they have no problem walking into an abortion clinic and killing a human being. I mean, there is such a mental disconnect and a spiritual disconnect to get to the point where you are oblivious or willfully oblivious 
of what is actually being done. However, having dealt with post-abortion survivors, they know what they've done deep down. Yes, they do. And you have to be extremely hard and callous for that not to affect you, but it still will affect you in your life. So where do we go with that, Truth Barista, as far as, let's say, the church or Christians? I mean, how do we respond? We want to respond to love people who are deceived, but at the same time, we must be firm and stand our ground, have strength and courage to defend what we know to be true. So I know there's a balance there, but but what is your advice? I mean, how do we push back at the same time, try to put our arm around people who do not understand? From my point of view, the same thing that's been going on since Roe v. Wade. You have to have a church that teaches its own disciples what life is, the value of life, what God's perspective is on all this. I mean, you've got to be standing firm on God's truth. Number two, the church has to be the megaphone of God's truth to society. Whether society wants to hear it or not, the church has to proclaim these things. This is why we openly and freely talk about these topics. We don't shy away from them. You know, when a student comes in here and brings up tough things like this, they're going to hear God's truth, and they're going to hear it in love, because it needs to be done in love, but they have to hear God's truth, and you have to put action to your words. So, this is where you get the sidewalk counselors, you get the protests, you have wonderful people like Pro-Life Action Ministries and other groups that are working to help young ladies carry through with their pregnancy and either have the baby or put the baby up for adoption. You have to have good foster parents. The church needs to take the lead as they did back in Roman days. The Romans would abort, air quotes, a baby because, you know, they tried to do it chemically or other ways. But if the baby is born, they would leave it on a particular wall and allow it to die in the elements. Well, Christians would go up and they would take these babies home and raise them themselves. This is the role of the church. They need to be the nursery. They need to be God's nursery to take care of the vulnerable, whether it's a baby or an elderly person or a person with mental handicaps. We need to be the safe zone for humanity. I love that story of the Roman babies. In society today, Truth Barista, if you talk against abortion to those who are in favor of it, it seems like it draws a line in the sand. And often we do not take that stand because we don't want to offend people. So that's a a question of loving people with the truth, but usually the truth has to win out. You can't ignore the truth in light of trying to be their friend with love, right? I mean, it seems to me there's a line that's automatically drawn, and you're an enemy if you stand against abortion. The line is God's truth, sir. That's where it is. And speaking lovingly, we can always do that, but we should always stand on God's truth. At times, we need to be dispassionate. We need to be very straightforward and reasonable on our arguments with God's truth. On the other hand, we do need to be passionate, and we we need to let that drive us forward in speaking truth to these disbeliefs. Sending people to hell is unjust. Sorry, God is patient with us. He doesn't want anyone to perish. He wants all to come to repentance. That's the truth. Abortion is not about a child. It's about tissue. No, God says it is a child. It is a child from conception. These are the truths we need to proclaim, and that's what we will continue to do here at the Erzatz Coffee Shop. Oh, Truth Barista, that's why I love these times in this booth, because you're just hitting topics and themes that so many churches will avoid because it creates, well, tension or a challenge challenge or a response. A lot of Christian leaders don't really want to do that. So I thank you for doing that and bringing up these topics and giving us such great insight. And you're welcome and wait till next week. Boy, do I have two hot button topics for you. I can't wait. This is Jay, your Truth Barista. Thanks for listening to the Truth Barista podcast. The best way to find out when a new podcast drops is through RSS feed. Go to our website, look for the RSS button, press it, and then enter your email. You'll be notified when a new podcast drops. Thanks for listening.